mostly I love unexpected contrasts um, is, is what I really like. So I like it when, you know, the, the protagonists are going through the middle of, uh, are going through the middle of this fantasy story and they run into this, you know, this aliens level encounter, uh, where there's a lot of creepy stillness. And then just as they freeze, all the bad guys who are around them that they didn't even see were there, start moving, you know? Um, I love the idea of taking these big fantasy characters and dropping them into the middle of a modern day U S city and making them deal with the problems that exist there. You know, I love the idea of queen Mab sitting in a theater somewhere baffled with her, her tub of popcorn, uh, uh, looking up at a Disney movie and going, what, you know, just, just, just being shocked at how much they've been toned down, you know? Um, uh, 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 I, I love taking those things that, that, that never really got a chance to exist side by side and sticking them there together. What is up, everybody? You're listening to episode 79 of SFF Addicts. I'm your host, Adrian M. Gibson, and welcome to your weekly dive into the world of science fiction, fantasy, and writing craft. Joining me as always is my co-host, the Chewy to my Han Solo, the Joker to my Commander Shepard, MJ Kuhn. How's it going, MJ? Hello, I'm doing lovely. How are you, Adrian? Doing very well today. We're recording on an afternoon, so MJ is spry as shit. So I feel She's great. A good time yeah, we're not recording in the <laughs> middle of the night for me. <laughs> Grandma MJ's on fire. Uh, and if you want to support Grandma MJ and her work, you can pick up a copy of Among Thieves and its sequel, Thick as Thieves, a complete duology full of heists and hatchets and fun stuff and people dying and people robbing and it's all good and you're going to love it as well. A quick note for listeners, the official SFF Addicts Patreon and merch store are live. So check the links in the description to support what we do here. Also, don't forget to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to the Fanfatic YouTube channel where this and every other episode of the show is available in full video. And now, welcoming today's guest, Jim Butcher, best-selling author of The Dresden Files, the Codex Alera series, The Cinder Spires, and more. Hi, Jim. How's it going? Yeah, by more, you mean that one Spider-Man book I wrote for Marvel once. <laughs> I listed everything and then more. <laughs> and more. <laughs> yeah, and more. Doing, Just Jim? that. And I did a, I did an essay about Stargate SG one at one point, and just there we go. Wrote him up as the as the classic adventuring party of fighter, magic user, cleric, thief, you know, and it it, it all fits together so well. Oh hell yeah! We're gonna link to that in the show notes for everyone who wants to go check. All it right, out. cool. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Well, uh, let's kick things off with the basics. In case some of our listeners have lived under a rock and aren't really familiar with you and your work, if you could introduce yourself and your books. Well, I'm Jim Butcher. Uh, I write a series of books. I'm best known for The Dresden Files, which was made into a television series on the Sci-Fi Channel for like five minutes. Um, uh, The series is, I'm working on book 18 right now, uh, uh, which should be done by the end of the year because the readers are going to want to know the the answer to that question. Um, And then we'll get into the publishing process and we'll see how long it takes to publish. Uh, Let's see. Um, the series, uh, basically is concerned with Harry Dresden, professional wizard. Uh, he has an ad in the phone book in Chicago. Uh, he occasionally consults with the police department and, uh, just sort of generally is the supernatural sheriff of, of, of the city of Chicago. And, uh, um, I have a lot of fun writing the series. Uh, I've been doing it for a good long while now. Uh, uh, and it's built enormously. There's all these characters. I, I, I got to kill some of these people. You, know? <laughs> you got to pull a George Martin and, and kill Oh, them. yeah, yeah. I got to Red Wedding and just get rid of a bunch of folks. Yeah. It's like, oh, I don't like writing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. That's also, crazy. deep cut with that Dresden Files TV show. I watched it and I think it was canceled after, what, one season? It got a season. It got almost most. It got most of a season, uh, uh, and then it got canceled for a bunch of shows that never did as well as it did. So, uh-huh. so well, that's I, I'm, I'm a little. Story, right? I may. I might get a little bitter. I might be a little bitter. Yeah, I can imagine. I can, <laughs> and that's <yeah>. fair. <laughs> well, we always like to dive into like the nerdy origin stories of our guests. So I'm curious, what was your fantasy and sci-fi like gateway drug as a as a kid or a teen? My sisters took me to the second day of Star Wars in 1977, nice. and it was all down. 
I mean, they, that, that was where I peaked as a non-nerd, and uh, that it was, my non-nerd quotient just went down and down. <laughs> so to me, your coolness oh quotient went way up at that point. I mean, just saying. Well, sure. I mean, nerds are cool now. But that wasn't always the case. <laughs> Especially true. the second screening of Star Wars. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was pretty great. Then when Empire came out, uh, they showed up at school and lied to my principal and told him I had a, a, a I had a, a dentist appointment. And then they took me to the first showing of Empire in KC that was downtown in the old opera theater, you know, that had the big swoopy curtains that pulled back and everything oh, like that. Nice. And uh, then it was something similar for uh, uh, Return of the Jedi. Um, so. Naturally, when when my son's generation Star Wars came along, the Lord of the Rings, I made sure to do the same thing with him. You know, yeah, so. that. My old, my, one of my oh one yeah, of my older that, brothers that, took me to is, the that. midnight screening of the Two Towers, uh, uh -huh. and that was at the shitty theater in the town that I grew up in. But it had the velvet curtains and everything too, and yeah. that was like midnight, and I was ten. My right. parents were adamantly opposed to it, but my brother took me anyways, and I didn't go to school the next day because it was like I came home at four. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense to me. You got to pass it on to the next important. generation. Yeah, yeah there's some things that are important. I don't know if we'll see a film like Lord of the a, a trilogy like Lord of the Rings again. That was amazing. Uh, that was something that was crafted. It was obviously done by a bunch of people who just really loved it and wanted to do a great job. You know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of craft, can you tell us a bit more about your writing journey in terms of like how you went from seeing Star Wars as a kid to wanting to write your own books? Well, um, I wrote my first book on on notebook paper in fourth grade, you know, uh, uh, and I followed that up with uh, a screenplay and a, and and a stage play that was all grade school stuff. Um. From there, I sort of got into computers because video games were awesome as well, and so I was planning on doing computer things, and, and that was my that was my aim, you know, on my way out of high school. But um, three days before school was out, this will tell you what kind of what kind of student I was because I was the student that all the teachers liked because I did really well. But it was my senior year, so I was skipping class, you know, because <laughs> rebel that cool you rebel, you and. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, but I was skipping class to go to the library and hang out and read. So <laughs> the most know. wholesome rebel of all time. <laughs> yeah. exactly. So the vice principal who was in charge of discipline at the high school came in and uh, he knew me from various, you know, academic award ceremonies and so on. His name was Leroy Brown. He was seriously bad, bad Leroy Brown. What a great <laughs> and, name. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, he intimidated, you know, uh, uh, people into behaving. And he comes in and says, oh, Jim, you must be here for the author talk. And I said, yes, I am here for the author talk. I am not at all skipping class. Why don't I help you set up chairs? <laughs> so, so I helped him. I helped him set up chairs. And uh, uh, um, and then uh, Margaret Weiss came in and Margaret Weiss. I knew who she was because I'd read Dragonlance because I, I grew up in the 80s and was a nerd. So I'd read Dragonlance. Uh, because there were only three or four fantasy series really up at the time, <laughs> you know, there was Dragonlance, there was Elfstones, there was Lord of the Rings, you know, you might get lucky and, and find Narnia and uh, the Pride Ain Chronicles. But other than that, there, there was not a ton of fantasy out there. You know, you had some Zelazny, you had some of the older stuff uh, uh, from, you know, like Fritz Leiber and so on. But for, but for new stuff, you didn't really see very much. Uh, and it wasn't until after the Dragonlance Chronicles went big and, and TSR started expanding their stuff that you really began to see a lot more fantasy and then a lot more fantasy, you know, a lot more epic fantasy in the, uh, uh, just in the regular publishing as well. Uh, but in any case, she, she talked about how cool it was being an author. And I started thinking to myself, well, she's from independence, you know, she's just from this little town in Missouri and I'm from, Indi you know, I bet I could do it too. If she could do it, there's no reason I can't. And, uh, so I, I wrote my first book the next summer and it was terrible. And, uh, the summer after that, I wrote my second book. It was similarly awful. Uh, uh summer after that, I wrote another one and another one and another one. And then I started, to, uh, I, then I thought, well, maybe I should, you know, learn from someone, uh, <laughs> which, 
was both wise and not wise because I went out to learn and I, I started learning from the uh, from the English literature department at OU, and uh, I think it only set my career back two or three years. You know, so I don't think it's <laughs> yeah. too great. <laughs> not too bad. Uh, but they were in they were in a rivalry with the with the professional writing department in the in the department of journalism. So that was why when I started asking about where I would go to learn to write genre fiction novels, they directed me to English instead of over to the you know to 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 the the school of study that had a course entitled writing a genre genre fiction novel in which you wrote a genre fiction novel for, for, uh, for a semester's work and for a grade. Right. And, uh, so I wound up over there learning from, uh, Deborah Chester, uh, uh, Deborah, Ch- Debbie Chester. She's done a whole lot of, she's done a whole lot of writing. You know, she's, she's published 50 or 60 novels. She's, 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 she's a pro. Uh, uh, and now you can, you can read what she has to say about writing. She taught me everything I had, I had, I knew about writing and you can read her stuff in the, in a book called the fantasy fiction formula. It starts there. And then she has several other books on the craft of writing. And it's not about writing as an art. It's about writing as a practical craft. Uh, uh it's very much, uh, you know, it's not sculpture, it's carpentry. And, uh, Shows you how to build boxes that work, and and that you know that basically over and over that's that's what you do. Uh, um, so, uh, but anyway, I got into her class and I kept I kept writing more novels that were terrible, and uh, and she 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 had been telling me for a couple of semesters she'd been saying Jim you know when you're when you're talking about examples of good writing in class you're always talking about. You're always talking about either bu- either Babylon Five or Buffy because that's what was on the air at the time. Dude, that was uh, Michael Michael J. Sullivan was also heavily inspired by both of those shows. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Babylon Five was yeah. was. I mean, it was it was some of the most amazing long term TV writing we we've ever seen, and we still haven't seen better, in my opinion, anyway. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, uh, so she says she says you're always talking about Buffy or B Five. Um, why don't you write some science fiction or uh, or some urban fantasy? And I didn't want to be contemptuous of her in front of the whole class, you know, but it was like, <laughs> dear, <laughs> I'm swords and horses fantasy author. You know, that, that's <laughs> what I, you know, I wanted to talk and stuff. And she's like, yeah, but maybe you should just give this a try and think of it as a, as a way to develop your abilities that you will need to be able to write books like that. Right. And, and because she didn't, and because she rolled with the punches and remained persuasive, I was like, okay, I'll prove you wrong. I'm, I, what, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to fill out every single little form that you have. I'm going to do all these little worksheets. I'm going to do all your little outlines and, and character sheets and story notes and, and, and pacing uh, worksheets and so on. And you're going to see what terrible cookie cutter pablum crap emerges from this kind of process. And I wrote the first book of the Dresden Files. <laughs> You know, which, which showed her. Um, <laughs> I love that the first yeah. book, I love that Stormfront was a spite, right? That's it was. Great. It was. Spite is a great motivator, <laughs> to be quite book honest. Was, <laughs> the Alara book was the same thing. The Alara book was the same thing, just with randos yeah. on the internet. You know, that I was in arguments with on the internet. Right. And um, mm-hmm. so that was, you know, that that was interesting. But I'm, I'm uh, uh, yeah, I've. I've made a lot of hay out of being really foolish and, and, and trying to put my money where my mouth is. So, uh, Just fucking roll with it, yeah. It's working I well, I, so. We're all happy about it, and I that's myself, how it started. <laughs> I take myself too seriously, you know? It's just not uh, – uh, uh, I, I know where I've been, and I can't take myself seriously, so yeah. why should I expect anybody else to? But that's the fun. We, we shouldn't take ourselves too seriously. But right. No. After, no we, <laughs> after you spite wrote Stormfront and then ended up getting it published in 2000 – and then continuing the series for 16 books, 16 more books now, yep. you know, when you first wrote that book and then after its publication and everything, at what point were you starting to think like, this is not just a first book, this could potentially be something longer. Or were you anticipating like, I'm just going to leave it at that and go back to my Tolkien fantasy? The answer to that is also embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> bring it on, bring when, on the embarrassment. We love it. When I brought the first couple of chapters into Debbie, uh, I was in, a, I was in, I was in a, uh, it was a, it was a, uh, a consult course. So you came in once a week, you handed her a couple of chapters. She read them. She gave you feedback on them. And then she sent you off to do better. <laughs> you know, that was sort of the way, that was sort of the way she rolled. Uh, uh, Debbie did not believe in, in not preparing her students for the real world and what New York was actually like. So, you know, she would give you, she would give you criticism and she would just smack you down. Occasionally she would smack you down without telling you why. And then she said, no, you got to figure it out. This is what you'll be doing in real life. 
And then a week later, she'd come back and say, no, nah, you figured it out wrong. Here's what I meant. <laughs> and so, so that she could help you start learning to interpret what editors wanted, not necessarily what they were asking for. Uh, uh, so, so, but anyway, I took the first couple of chapters of Stormfront in. I handed them to her. She picks them up and reads them. She puts them down, squares off the pages, sets them down in front. And she, bear in mind, she had criticized me up to and including rolling up the chapters, leaning across the desk, popping me on the head and saying, what were you thinking? <laughs> done that as part of the critique before. So she, she, she finishes up and, and, and she squares the papers off and looks up at me and says, you did it. And I said, what? She says, you did it. This is professional quality writing. I don't know if it'll be the first thing you sell, but you will be able to sell this eventually. I want you to come back in next week with an outline for the rest of it. And she meant the rest of the novel. Right. Next week, I roll in <laughs> with outlines for a 20-book-long series with a, with, a, with, with a capstone trilogy at the end of it to square everything off. I'm babbling about it all the way through. I mean, it's like a 40-minute course, right? And I, I'm just babbling at her all the way through. And we get to where there's like two or three minutes left, and I realize she hasn't said a word the entire time. And then I stop, and I say, what do you think? <laughs> and I still see the look on her face, you know, as, as she was – she was deciding what to give me in, in this. And I think she had figured, well, I finally got this kid on board. You know, I finally got him, uh, uh, you know, actually going along with the program. So, you know, I shouldn't discourage him too much. There's no way I should tell him that he's never going to sell a 20 book series coming out the gate because that's impossible. <laughs> so she says, you know, I, I think that if you can sell a 20 book series, you should be doing fine. And I was like, oh. <laughs> And I and I took that as her blessing, and I went forth. And because she hadn't told me it was impossible, I it did it. You know, so it just sort of worked out that way. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I the the first contract was for three books, and I knew that if I could sell them three books, I could sell them you know, I could sell them twenty. Uh, so I worked as hard as I could on those three books to make sure they were awesome. And when they were getting ready for a fourth book, I said, "How about I sell you four and five? And they said, "Okay." And, and so, and, and I, I gave them four and five and they were both, they were, you know, they were both in pretty good shape. And, and I think the main reason they worked with me was, was they didn't have to do too much work, uh, to get me into a published date. You know, I, I, the way my process works, I tend to write pretty clean. And, uh, by the time they get the book, you know, I don't, I want them to not have to do any work because it's way less frustrating for me. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, but I handed I, I handed all I, you know uh, I handed all those in, and I knew I could if I, if I could sell them three, I could sell them a few more, and if I could sell them a few more, I could have enough momentum for a series at that point. So I did that, and it worked out. And then it, at some point, I was getting uh, really tired of 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 not making you know of, of not breaking minimum wage with my writing job. So I said, "Hey, can I write a second series?" And they're like, "Well, what do you what do you got?" And and so I showed them. Uh, um, I showed him the uh, uh, the first book of the Codex Alera, which had been shopped around to all the major publishers before uh, uh, a couple of years before, and they'd all said no, thank you. Uh, but I, I had a different agent who took it and said, you know what, we need to change the orders of these opening chapters around. This needs to go here. This needs to go here. This character needs to not do this, and this character needs to do that. And if you can just make these small changes, which took me, you know, maybe two 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 hours to do, you know, if that long. Because uh, it was mostly just copying and pasting and putting things in different order. She, if you do that, I'll be able to sell it. And so I, I did what she said, and sure enough, you know, Jennifer sold it, and uh, I had a deal for three books uh, uh, because I had been established myself as somebody who could do series and turn things in. So uh, uh, that's how we got to where I am today, basically. Until I got to the Spider-Man book, which put me behind my schedule, and I've never been back on on track since. <laughs> Spider-Man was your nemesis. Well, I want to talk a little bit because after being with Harry Dresden and the Dresden Files for four several books, um, I, <laughs> it sounds like there were several motivations for going to Codex Alera from spite to additional financial <laughs> gain. But also what, what made you decide to tackle a younger protagonist is kind of what I'm curious about because the protagonist of Codex Alera is quite a bit younger than, than yeah. our pal Harry. <laughs> and the farm boy in the middle of nowhere who's actually a secret prince. Listen, I don't make the rules for fantasy. <laughs> I just don't. You know, I mean, that, that's, been done by, yeah. that's been done by far greater writers than me. <laughs> but I wanted to take that basic model, you know, of kind of the basic fantasy story and start with that. And... And to see what I could do with it, and I and I was gonna I was gonna mix it in with you know uh, uh, Roman Legion stuff and and Pokemon under another name, and uh, uh, that was and I figured okay that should that should make things different enough that it should be unique, 
And, uh, well, you know, the greatest thing about writing a fantasy series, those things have legs. They're not attached to anything in the real world. There's no references or anything like that. You know, you have to create absolutely everything. So lots of time can go by and your fantasy book is still um, just as relevant as it was you know, uh, as, as it was before, because you're, you're dealing with a different world. You're engaging much more imagination from the reader. You know, you're creating a much greater sense of escapism, at least in my opinion. Uh, uh, and that's why you can still go out and buy Narnia now. You can still go out and buy Lord of the Rings now, you know, uh, those books, those books hang around. Yeah. And for, it's hard to find you, a copy of Ember these days. <laughs> but for you, how satisfying was it to to bring that series to a conclusion? Because it's like you have this massive plan for Dresden, 20 books taking however many years to get to the end point to finish the Codex Alera series. It started off as a class project, man. It just got out yeah. of hand. I- <laughs> <laughs> Everything gets out of hand, dude. Yeah. <laughs> But how was it for you to finish that, finish the Codex Alera series and, and, and think like, okay, this is done. Or do you think at some point you'd ever return to the, that world and those characters? I, I might just because more and more I've gone back and re- reread it a couple of times. And every time I go back and reread it, I go, oh, wow, that was really well done. And I had no idea I was doing it, but good job, me. You know, well, well done. <laughs> Uh, or, or, ooh, that was really subtle work there. I never noticed this was happening. You know, good, good job, me. And, and I think to myself, well, it's a great story world, and I have a lot of cool characters in it, and I've got lots of places I can go back into the story if I want to. Um, but on the other hand, I've got all these other ideas for 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 stories that I want to do, and I'm going to have to live to be like 124 to get them all written. Uh, which, which is theoretically possible, you know, based on based on how you know medical developments and so on. So, um. So, you know, we'll see how that works out. But uh, uh, I, I got to tell you, I, I occasionally miss Alara. I had I had a really good time there. And, uh, you know, the, I based the I mean, the, the central character was based on my kid, on my son, James, uh, who is an author himself now. Uh, uh, he's he's better than me. It's really disgusting. I mean, he's he's like over six feet tall. He's built like Henry Cavill because he works out it, it, in order to work out his stress. He goes to the gym. And he's like, well, you're going to be addicted to something. You might as well be addicted to something that's good for you. And so he's addicted to weight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and he's, he's, he's smarter than I am and he's a wonderful human being. And, uh, and, uh, uh, he's a better writer than I was at, at this point in, in my career. Uh, so kid's going to leave me eating dust one of these days. You know, <laughs> you're going to be, be 124. <laughs> he's going to be, what, like, Oh, he'll be, well, he, he'll, or something. he lives that long, you know, because you know. <laughs> Those weightlifters, they go young sometimes. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to all the, weight, all the weightlifters out there. <laughs> to all the weightlifters who listen to this podcast. Although MJ's big into, I know, into, I was gonna into say working me. out. So, yeah. yeah. Take that, yeah, MJ. I, I'm screwed. <laughs> I'm so excited. I've, I've, got a, I've got a detached garage, and I, I got the flooring, and now I've got the squat cage and the good bench, and I've got my bumper plates and, and my Olympic bar cage. Day. I'm going to go out there after this today and go work out in my very own gym, you know, yeah. without needing, to, without needing to go to the Y and wait in line behind the teenagers. Yeah, man. And I'm excited about that. And then you can, then you can spite work out because your son is just like, yeah. you know, showing you up. But he's, <laughs> I think the difference for him is that he has done, he's, he did a lot of learning from me and we did. And, and the way I taught him writing was, was, was he would write stuff and I'd read it and then I'd roll it up and, and hit him on the head and say, what were you thinking? <laughs> um, except it was always on my iPad. So it hurt more than it hurt me. And I told him <laughs> before him. <laughs> and, uh, 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 and then we would watch, uh, something on TV. Uh, uh, and you know, we would go through whichever show was on that we were very interested in or whatever. And we would, we, and I would point out, okay, this was really good writing right here. This was an opportunity they missed. Here's, here's something else. They, here's something that they just dropped the ball completely. And as we, as we gone through, you know, he is, he became a much more, a much more analytical, uh, 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 um, uh, writer I am as, as far as, as, his, as his technique goes. So, you know, he would, he'll watch, I'll watch things and say, Okay, you know, that's really all I wanted out of Star Wars. There were some monsters, there was some blasters, there was a laser sword or two, there were some spaceships exploding. I had fun. And he's like, Yeah, but imagine how much more fun it would have been if. And then he would go through and start saying, Well, what if they'd done this here? What if they'd done this here? And, and do you ever even think about this part here? Because this completely undermines everything that came after it. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I would stop and think and go, Damn, the kid's right. <laughs> Just, just shut up and enjoy the Star Wars, okay? You know, just for the old man, you know. 
he'd be like, okay, dad, go to the next episode. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> oh it's like, just God. give me, give me my, give me my vices, man. You know? Yeah. Yeah. My vices. Well, I have but, to but, drop but, in so a note on do that. Codex. We sit down and watch cartoons yeah. and TV and yeah. And that's what we, two days a week we get together. We go out and walk the dog. We go out and get pho. And uh, then we sit down and watch and sit down and watch TV and uh, uh, and then talk about how, what we could have done to make it cooler. But I tell you what, if I ever there's uh, I'm sort of interested in, in doing a, an, an animated series of the Dresden Files, which I think would be really cool. That maybe would I'd get, be great. Yeah. Maybe I could get the Castlevania people to work with me. Who knows? Ooh. That would be um, dope. Oh, oh, Dresden File anime would be awesome. I, I've, be I've had the opening sequence in my head for like 15 years. Uh, 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 it's too, it's too, it's too, the, it's too that Evanescence song that everybody knows. I, I don't know if they did any other ones, but they did that one really good one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but it's to that one. And, uh, uh, and, and, and it, it just, it does, just does the, the standard character introduction, you know, of them doing action stuff with the camera swooping everywhere and, you know, things going a little bit too fast to really track what's going on. So you have to rewind it and watch it again. Uh, and that would be, that would be a lot of fun. Uh, I've also looked at, uh, um, um, the studio that did Invincible, uh, uh, which I think I thought Invincible was done really, really well. Um, there was some really good writing done in that. There was some great character stuff in that. And uh, I thought it had a really great balance of kind of goofy comic book action with real danger, with like actual psychological terror moments, you know, between when, 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 when Invincible's mom is looking around, you know, and, and gathering information about her husband being a murderer and him just sort of showing up and you realizing that's Superman, you know, he can wreck her completely. And, and then, and, and then, you know, they did all that and they balanced it with these emotional interactions between the characters that were just very real. Um, and so it's like, Ooh, it's tough to hit that balance. And I, I really respect that. That kind of works amazing. I mean, that was, that was, that was almost as good as Lois Bujold stuff. And Lois Bujold is, the, is, you know, I professionally speaking, I want to have her babies. <laughs> <laughs> that is perhaps the greatest sentence Quotable ever. Quote. Professionally speaking. Oh, I would speaking. like to have your babies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Lois, Lois Bujold is amazing. She, she, if you haven't read her books, uh, you should do yourself a favor and do so as, as quickly as you can. Love that. No, I've never was, read any of things. Ever, no, I was going to say, I haven't either. So. Yeah, uh, she, the, the one she's the famous for, are called, <laughs> yeah, the one she's famous for, are called the Vorkazigan Saga, and it's a it's about a family, uh, the Vork, the Vorkazigan family, and it starts off it start and she started off as a Star Trek fan fiction writer, where she had a Starfleet uh, uh, apparently she had a Starfleet uh, uh, officer and a Klingon officer, and and uh, that were trapped on a planet together and had to work together to survive in order to get out, and then. They, know if they were going to be running into the arms of the Klingons or the Federation. And so they kind of had to make a deal with each other ahead of time. And there wound up being some kind of bromance. But she did it with uh, 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 she did it with uh, uh, this guy from a planet who was basically revolutionary Russia, you know, had that, that kind of sensibilities because she was a Russian history scholar. And oh, my gosh, what a place to be from. But he was like the one noble guy in a den of cutthroats and thieves. And, and then and then, uh, and then her her heroine character was, you know, from this from this very progressive, forward thinking. She was the captain of a planetary survey team that was out exploring the universe, and she sort of ran, run runs across this warmonger, <laughs> and and then they have to work together to survive, and they have to learn, you know, and they start seeing the holes in each other's in each other's societies, and then they get together and say, maybe we can build a better one, and. And that, you know, and it's this long series of them and their kids and, you know, their extended family and so on. And Lois does such an amazing job of blending plot and character and world building all together so smoothly that there's no transitions between them. Um, and professionally speaking, she's stunning. Um, so I, and, I, and she's one more Hugo's than anybody alive. She's fantastic. Go read her. Yeah. That sounds fantastic. That sounds like the the antidote that the Cold War needed. But it, it, like, you know, you're not wrong. Packaging. You're not wrong. Damn. And it was kind of it was kind of because because the momentum for the war was falling apart, and everybody was looking around, going, "Hey, can't we do so, something better than this?" Uh, and uh, she, you know, she came along at a good time for that. But yeah, also also just a just an amazing writer, and and the sweetest person. She is. You know, just the, the greatest introverted nerd person you've ever seen. And, and characters are so vibrant. They're, they're incredible. 
right, I got this. I'm, I'm right, it, man. right. Yes, as you type good. in, you're making a list. Um, well, speaking of <laughs> vibrant characters and seamless world building, look at that transition, Adrian. I want to dive right. into it's the, afternoon. the Cinder on the ball. Spires. Yeah, I want to dive into Cinder Spires series um, because I mean, I'm, they're great. Um, I, I'm so curious to see what inspired these books. How did you come up with this incredibly fascinating world that you've devised for these books? Um, you know, just kind of what was the process like uh, in the early stages? Well, I was I was done with Alara, and I was getting set to do a new project, and I had to figure out what it was going to be. So I had about four different projects I could do. So I wrote four or five chapters of the first book of each project and sent it to my beta group to see what they thought. And one of them was uh, sort of a it was sort of a novel about it, it was kind of a, it was based on the Black Company, and it was about this this company of, of fantasy mercenaries who were out. And, you know, the, the giant war, you know, the epic war between good and evil had sort of collapsed economically <laughs> and they weren't able to fight it anymore. So they were and their company had been hired to essentially go to this area of wilderness that they thought would be uh, good to develop in the future. And they were going to build a castle. And it was just the, the series was just called Castle. And I was going to go through what it took to construct a castle and the kinds of things that it could that could that could, you know, get involved and get in the way of it getting done and all the things that were just uh, um you know, that, that would be historically, you know, cool about doing that only with a bunch of fantasy stuff mixed in as well. Uh, and so that was a lot of fun. I like that one. Um, there was a, um, uh, kind of X-Men meets men in black on the moon science fiction, uh, which I've still got, I've got, I've still got half of that first novel done and I really should finish it just because it was, I went back and reread it recently and it's good. Uh, I should, I should write it just because, you know, I, I, I they're going to take my house away if I don't. Um, <laughs> And, um, uh, uh, the the men in see. black are going to take your house away. Is that what you're <laughs> yeah. To? Oh, I always figure if I get too close to something, I can just go to the government and say, "Listen, just tell me the truth. I'll write yeah. it up as fiction, and you'll have deniability forever." Yeah. We're in the yeah. area of we're in the era of UFOs and all that shit. So you're yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But uh, uh, and then there was another. There was my there was the first couple of chapters of my fantasy Incredibles novel. Uh, and then there was uh, 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 the steampunk that I started putting together. And by far, I got the strongest reaction for the steampunk, probably because there were talking cats built into it. Um, and I, I really should have known better. Uh, <laughs> uh, when, when my, my uh, but they, I got the strong reaction from the talking cats and, uh, and, and the, the kind of the steampunk sensibilities and sort of, you know, writing with a little bit more of that formal stilted tone, you know, that goes into it. Uh, uh, you know, that the, the goes into that sort of setting. And, uh, uh, and I had a great deal of fun writing it. And, and when I was putting it together, you know, I, I honestly sat down and say, okay, Jim, what do we, how, the thing, the thing is you're putting together your steampunk world. You really need a reason for everybody to have goggles because the steampunk kids who are cosplaying love their goggles. <laughs> and so I said, okay, how am I going to do that? So I started putting my story world together. And it's like, you know what? I need to assemble this like a science fiction world, not like a fantasy world. Okay. And so why why are these guys? Why are they, oh, okay. That's what's happening. I understand sort of the overall story better. But it all started off with trying to figure out why you wear your goggles all the time. And uh, uh, it's to keep bad things from happening to to organisms that have gotten into your blood uh, that, that when they get into your eyes, they they get exposed to ultraviolet light and break down and release mercury into you. So if you don't if you don't wear your goggles uh, uh, all the time when you're out in the sun, uh, uh, you will go crazy. You will go mad hat or crazy. Um, and and, you know, then then after this, so it's like, OK, now that I know that I can start building all these other things. So it's like, OK, I don't want balloons. So I have to have something else to make things fly. Uh, let's use crystals. Those are they, I, I noticed a lot of crystals on the on the on the on the, the, the steampunk cosplayers. But I was basically building it, building it for the cosplayers. And when I was doing people's characters, I was saying, okay, how are we going to make this a distinctive character outfit that people are going to want to cosplay? We'll do it like this. And and uh, I mean, I was I, I, it was just shameless the way I put that together. And it's, but then it was like, okay, we need to have talking cats. So how did that happen? And then I realized, oh, this wasn't just something for cats. This was a whole planet thing. And and. You know, and so and that that fed into the planet being this kind of death world that where where, you know, it was there, there was an invading hostile species that was trying to xenoform the, the planet to what they wanted. And uh, uh, and although that war was over, their machinery essentially was still running, trying to do it. And, and you know, uh, uh, meanwhile, the home planet had tried to, it, to try to arrange itself to fight back. And so there's you know, there's all these areas where 
if you walk as a human, you're, you're, you're in a war zone. You're probably going to die unless you know what you're doing. Um, and, and, but then there's all these other places that are, that, you know, are going to look a lot more familiar I and mean, we're not going to see that until we actually get there. And, and we, we get, we get to the planet a little bit in the new book. We, we go, we go to the surface just a little bit, like walking out a quarter of a mile, a quarter of a mile from one spire puts two people in the hospital. You know, that, that sort of, you know, it's, it's that sort of hostility. <laughs> Uh, uh, but then in the next one, we actually, now that I've established how dangerous it is in book three, you know, at the end of the book two, we crash one of the characters and one of the characters goes down with the ship and crashes on the planet. And, uh, uh, and, and they're just trapped there and nobody's quite sure where they are. They're going to have to survive along with their, their very best enemy. Uh, uh, so because that's, that's just a great setup when you take the enemies yeah. and you put them together and have to cooperate. Oh, I, I, I love it when I love it when a, you're in the middle of a fight and a tea party breaks out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's the thing about this series is like, and, and, and a lot of your work is there's this really good balance between the humor and the sort of lighter elements, but also the, the heavier themes and the things that you just kind of get through beneath the surface. And, you know, with the Cinder Spires, it's like you have steampunk fantasy with sky pirates and goggles and cosplay, you know, stuff that'll really satisfy the cosplayers and all that. But at the same time, it's like you're able to blend these genres and use that as a framework to explore deeper aspects of human human reality. So for you, you know, with like the Dresden Files, with the Cinder Spires and all these different things, what is your favorite thing about that ability to use fantasy and blending genres? to explore those things um mostly i love unexpected contrasts um is is what i really like so i like it when you know the the protagonists are going through the middle of uh, are going through the middle of this fantasy story and they run into this you know this aliens level encounter where there's a lot of creepy stillness, and then just as they freeze, all the bad guys who are around them that they didn't even see were there start moving. You know, um, I love the idea of taking these big fantasy characters and dropping them into the middle of a modern day U.S. city and making them deal with the problems that exist there. You know, I love the idea of Queen Mab sitting in a theater somewhere, baffled with her her tub of popcorn. Uh, uh, looking up at a Disney movie and going, what, you know, just, just, <laughs> just being shocked at how much they've been toned down, you know? Um, uh, uh, I, I love taking those things that, that, that never really got a chance to exist side by side and sticking them there together. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I was one of the guys who, who got out the star Wars and the GI Joe's models and played them all together, you know, because we, we were never going to see that on screen. Uh, uh, so, you know, I, I, a whole bunch of my writing has just been my nerdy, nerdy self reaching out and creating the things that I wanted but never got to see. And and I think I think I think that's really that's driven a lot of what I've done. And then at some point I realized, oh wait, this is how cool nerdy stuff happens. Um, uh, and and I, I I started doing a lot more encouraging of other people. Hey, you need to go out. You know, if you can't find this book that you really want, I, I'm I'm not the one who needs to write that book. You're the one that needs to write that book. Well, you know, figure out how to do it. And uh, uh, I really think that um, there is so much creative potential in so many people. I've known so many people who were amazing writers who who would have just utterly thrashed the industry with with how good their stuff was, but because they really didn't believe in themselves, or or because they you know because they had they had decided oh it's not real my writing isn't really important all this other stuff is important you know that that we're never going to get to see the beauty that those minds could have created and it just breaks my heart. But what can I do about it except you know keep trying to create more, you know and, and try and help people you know try and help people who are coming up. You know, yeah. folks like Ron. Pan it forward. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I'd, I'd pay my teacher back very poorly uh, if I didn't do everything I could to to teach other, to, you know, to teach these young writers who are coming up. Hey, here's uh -huh. the here's the stuff you need to know. Here's the stuff that doesn't change over time. Yeah. Bop them on the head with a rolled up piece of paper. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, it's the modern Poor era. I, I mean, I don't make the rules. <laughs> it's just the technology. Gotta use the tech now, man. Got electronic submission. <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, we touched on him a little earlier. I want us to talk about cats, though. Uh, unsurprising okay. to anyone. I love me some cats. Um, so one of my favorite things, like which uh, it sounds like was a popular opinion with your beta readers as well, um, 
is the intelligent cats that they speak, but only if you know their language. Um, so to kick things off with there, is there a real world cat that inspired Raoul specifically? <laughs> yeah, well, there was Raoul, and then there was uh, 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 then the, then there was the real world Raoul came along after, got named after him. Uh, but oh my God, was he he was he the most the most precious princess of a cat? <laughs> oh. Uh, he absolutely adored one person would be my ex would be in her lap all the time, would be snuggling her all the time. I would very occasionally get a pity snuggle you know, from <laughs> Raoul. Um, but Raoul was constantly annoyed because he was huge. He was a Maine Coon and he was a ginger Maine Coon and he weighed, wow. he weighed about 29 pounds. Wow. But we also had a pure white Maine Coon that, that had uh, uh, the uh, dichro- dichromatic, whatever that is, the eye thing. Uh, like David Bowie. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 he had a green one, and, and he had a green one and a yellow one, and we named him Bowie, and uh, and he was like thirty two pounds. He was this huge white thing, and, and and he was just a big old snuggler. And Bobo was my man. Uh, uh, he'd come snuggle up at me, and he'd just kind of go whoomp like that against me. And um, but yeah, Raoul, and then we had a, we had a black cat named Meryl, uh, who was also a Maine Coon. She merely weighed eighteen pounds. Um, uh, and then, and then we, and then we, we picked up several other little cats, uh, 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 who we eventually, you know, got put into homes, uh, uh, here and there, but the ones that stayed with us, one of them was, was like feral and she didn't really want a whole lot to do with any humans, but she bonded to our cats. So our cats had a cat, um, <laughs> she was like a little, she was like this tiny little five pound black and white tuxedo cat. And we named her Zaza, uh, after from, from DC and, uh, and then there's a there was a little gray and brown tabby named Fenris who was the he he weighs he was also a permacat and he weighs five pounds and he was the absolute alpha cat because the big cats would come up to him and he would just sort of look at them like they were naughty children and they'd, they'd come running up to like bowl him over and he look he'd just sit there like really and not move and they'd sort of slam to his top as if he had a force field of some kind oh, as if they were saying <laughs> oh no it's a wizard cat he's not reacting properly. <laughs> But the cat's taught my pit bull respect. He still has lots of little lines on his nose from when he was a puppy learning respect. <laughs> and uh, now, now, now I've got, I've got the, the, the little tabby Fenris uh, stayed with me. He, he, he decided I was his person. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, I've got him and the 95 pound pit bull Brutus and, and Brutus is, he doesn't deserve the name Brutus. So we call him brew. That works better. Um, but the, he'll be lying on his bed and the little five pound cat will come over and just pat, pat his nose with a paw like that. And Brutus will go and he'll get up and he'll leave the bed and the, the cat will curl up. Tiny cat will curl up in the giant pit bull's bed in the warm spot that Brew made wow. for him. Oh Brew will go to the edge of the bed and just lay his chin on the bed, you know, not like, too close to Fenway. Right. That is, yeah. a, that is a serious brother. alpha move. <laughs> I'm just, yeah. just going to warm up the bed for me. Right. That's right. And then I'm going to roll in like a scold. I, I need to write a story about the Brutus and Fenris detective agency where, where, oh, where you know, Fenris goodness. is brains and the muscle and Brutus is the heart. You know? <laughs> Dude, that sounds beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It would be a fun book. I got some pictures of them where it looks like, I mean, I could just put some, you know, some, uh, a deer stalker cap on one yeah. of them and we'd be fine. You know, put another one in a West. That's some cosplay. Right. Oh, yeah. You got this. Well, do you have any advice for for anyone out there looking to include animals in their in their adult fantasy book without? I mean, you mentioned it earlier without making them yeah. Disney, you know, animals, having, animals having that balance there. Yeah, there's always the, there's always a known rule among writer among writers is that animals and children will steal the scene every time. So you got to be real careful with the animals and children. You've got to make sure that they have stuff to do. Because if you don't if you don't keep them busy, you know, in your planning, uh, uh, you know, they will they will kind of take over the story. Uh, and now now it's not quite so bad with Raoul and the talking cats because, you know, they sort of have their own interests and limits. And really, the stuff that's going on with the humans is just sort of it's not important. It's human stuff. How important yeah. could it be? You know, I mean, that's sort of the attitude Fair. about all of it. <laughs> and, so, and, and, and I do that mostly to keep them from taking over the show. Uh, uh, which they're, which they're going to tend to do anyway. Um, but yeah, just be cautious and make sure you've got pl- definite plans. Um, you know, the Dresden files mouse was becoming way too Superman, uh, uh, for the Dresden files. So, you know, mouse kind of got, got, got his, his duties relegated over here to, to, to taking care of Maggie most of the time. So, you know, he's got that on his back to, as a handicap, cause otherwise he'd be far cooler than Dresden. <laughs> Cause you weren't willing, you weren't willing to kill anybody. So you did that at least. <laughs> you just well, yeah, so, and, oh yeah. And be real careful with killing animals because 
Oh, yeah. You know, they're super epic villains, you know, dying horribly and, you know, your, your parents dying tragically in a fire. That's stuff that most people haven't run into in real life. Almost everybody's lost a pet and they know what that pet is. And you have to, you have to treat that, you know, that's something real and you've got to treat that with respect. So, you know, be real careful about offering harm to animals. Yeah. Uh, plus, you know, it's just good, just good karma. Yeah, it's great <laughs> advice. We never kill the animals. No, I mean, like, you know, some people do. Uh, <laughs> so you took quite a break um, between Aaron and Twinless and uh, at the time of airing the, the newly released Olympian Affair. It sounds like Spider-Man might have been to blame based on earlier conversations here. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I no? Spider-Man for that. <laughs> Can't blame Spider-Man on that one. I'm just no, curious how it felt to Pete. return to this world and these characters for another book release eight years after the first and whether it's more or less nerve wracking than releasing a sequel pretty rapidly after book one. Oh, it's probably more nerve wracking because I, it's going to be hard to, I knew it was going to be hard to get um, folks, you know, reinvested after it had taken so long, which is partly why I added in, uh, uh, I added in an apology novella, <laughs> to go, <laughs> I mean, which I wrote to be kind of, it's it's all from Benedict's point of view, and Benedict is this warrior born character. He's kind of a super soldier, uh, uh, but he's also he does, really doesn't like being a super soldier. He, he would sort of prefer to be a, an effete, refined snob. Uh, uh, but you know, he has to go out and be Captain America occasionally. And uh, uh, so I wrote I wrote that from his point of view uh, as sort of a, a sort of an, a James Bond mission at the beginning of the James Bond movies, where James Bond mm -hmm. would start off in the middle of something, and you just sort of see him dealing yeah. with his problems. And then he has, and so the, what, and then he has like the epic escape, like you know, like going under the water or jumping. Yeah, exactly. And then and that's how that's how the that's how the title sc screen starts, and that's a, it's just like sort of a here's an inaction welcome to our world, and that's what I tried to do with this novella was to kind of write this you know write, write this 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 you know the secret mission that, that Benedict was on, and also to get people warmed up to the idea to kind of re you know reintroduce them to the world again after it had been so long, although I'm not sure I needed to have bothered with that in retrospect because fantasy fans are, are infinitely patient uh, uh, or, or if they're not patient, they're at least rereading furiously, you know? Uh, so uh, perhaps I didn't need to worry about that so much. I, perhaps I should have given my fans more credit, but, uh, <laughs> but I wanted to get that written to get a little bit of extra stuff out there. And, and, and it was, it was going to make the book just too long if I tried to include it in the book and it would, would have done weird things to the pacing. So it worked real, it worked much better as a novella. Uh, uh, and I'm going to start doing that. I think it's just kind of releasing novellas in between each of the novels that I do just to, uh, uh, just to kind of, you know, to keep people invested and to keep me, uh, uh, kind of interested with the smaller projects that I can do on a little bit more short-term basis. And that don't seem quite so intimidating. Uh, uh, it's weird because as a writer, it never gets less intimidating to write a novel. You know, uh, there's still, you know, there's still monumental things to write and and you know they take a lot of they take a lot of drive and a lot of discipline and a lot of focus and if you if you don't have it you just can't get it done yeah and at the same time i think like the fact that you were releasing other stuff you're releasing other dresden files novels in that period where there wasn't cinder spires i think people will probably be like okay i'm if they're a fan of cinder spires it's likely that they're also a fan of dresden files so they were probably a little bit satiated by by that more than likely more than likely yeah. uh, um i i really think the new book uh the olympian is called the olympian affair uh, uh and it's once again the crew of the, of the ams predator is off to get involved in 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 problems that are way off their scale um <laughs> but i think it's one of the better things i've written in a while um uh, i really i really poured a lot of attention into it it's um uh, the pacing is a lot tighter you know with a lot with the with the kind of the shorter chapters and the sort of the more furious, you know, forward pace, uh, uh, which I, I really enjoy writing and, uh, uh, all in all, it came out pretty well. I was very pleased with how it turned out. Uh, I had to do a whole lot of historical research for this one, uh, which is always fun. Well, you mentioned book three in the Cinder Spires. Um, can you talk, uh, at all about, you know, what's going on with that or what other projects you have? I mean, it sounds like book 18 of Dresden is also on the way you in general, you're, you got all these plates spinning. <laughs> so what's yeah. next for you after all that? <laughs> well, book 18 of Dresden, I need to have finished by the end of the year. Uh, I'm hoping to finish it by the end of November, but I, I've got this whole book tour and stuff for the Zinder Spire. So that way, um, but I should finish it by the end of the year. After that, I'll start on book three. Uh, I don't have, don't have a title for it yet, uh, but Cinder Spires 3, 
um, which is going to be, we're going to have uh, our action characters got wounded in the last book and we're going back to back, uh, back to back action on, on these two novels. So, you know, they're still, they're, they're still going to be gimping around hurt, uh, uh, but they're going to be doing stuff together. And, uh, 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 we've got one character trapped on the surface and, uh, uh, another character going off to search and look for them. Uh, there's a big war happening. Uh, 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 you know, kind of within range. I mean, you know, imagine living in Hawaii in, in the early stages of, of World War II. You know, what what be like? You know, how uncertain and how how worried you'd have to be. Uh, so, uh, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun uh, to write that one. I, I I I love writing the books. I I just love taking the characters and and, and I've got a good villain going. <laughs> with inspires people hate her. My beta reader. <laughs> You know, in, in each each time I put up a chapter, I've just got a real simple questionnaire that they fill out, which is what yeah. did you like? What did you not like? Did you have any questions? And and under under what did you not like in every chapter where the villain appears, they wrote, I don't like that you didn't kill this person. It's like, yes, I'm doing well. <laughs> <laughs> That's you know you're doing good. When, yeah, when you're turning your readers into bloodthirsty maniacs. You, you want this <laughs> they will wish for the death that you will not impart upon your characters. But... I think that's a sign of a good villain. If people are like, I actively hate this person. Oh, well, you sure. know, there are some, there's some villains we love to hate yeah. and we just love having them there and having them as, you know, ha having them in place. And honestly, you can, you can base the success of almost any given season of a TV show uh, or any movie on how good was the villain. And if the villain was a good villain, usually you do all right. And if the villain was not, I mean, they're, they're really, they're the stars of, of all these shows. Yeah. That's why Game of Thrones works so well up to a point. <laughs> oh yeah, you hate it. when the villains Some were the Lannisters. Just hate and all them. These, yeah, exactly. Oh wow, and it's like, and who, yeah. you know, who wasn't a villain on Game of Thrones? Kind of proves exactly. my point. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. All right, Jim. Well, uh, to close out, we have a, a two-parter to ask you. If you could give listeners and viewers a a good bit of soundbite writing advice, and B, tell us a weird or random fact that you find to be utterly fascinating. Okay, um, writing advice. Remember when you were coming out for writing. You are not competing with me. You're not competing with James. You're not competing with Stephen King, with Brandon Sanderson. You're not competing. You're not competing with any of those people. You're only competing with the other newbies. So until you've broken in, you are not in a big competition. Uh, uh, you are just competing with the other people who also don't know anything. Who also don't know anything, just like you. Um, uh, it's 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 very much a running away from a bear situation. You don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than that guy next to you. And that guy. And, and if you stick with it. If you stick with it long enough, um, then, then you, eventually you are going to be in that race. You're going to be the one who knows the most, who has the most experience, who writes the best story. That's eventually going to be you. And, and that's just inevitable as long as you stick with it and keep working. Uh, so that's the main thing is, is you, don't need, you, you don't really need a whole bunch of talent to do well as a writer. What you do need is an insane amount of perseverance. So if you can cultivate that, you're going to do fine. You'll, you'll um, outrun you outrun the other people and the bear exactly will eventually you'll outrun the other people and you don't have to worry and, and you know the bear will take care of itself um <laughs> now, now after that you're competing but actually after that you're not really competing i don't believe i'm in competition with anyone um there there are some other writers who just have a big fan base that might cross over that's 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 the only way i look at it it's like i love seeing other writers do well because it makes it easier to advertise to a whole group of people who might be interested in stuff that i'm doing uh yeah, I mean, honestly, there's not enough books. There's not enough good books. There just aren't. Um, uh, uh, let's see. And, it's, and for random facts, uh, 1.8. It's my favorite st statistic. 1.8 is the number of people on, on average killed by moose within the Anchorage city limits per year. Uh, and I think that's fascinating. I think it says a lot about moose. And I think it says even more about people. That's fair. Because how hard is it to avoid a moose? You know, I mean, they're, I'm from they're Canada. Not, they're oh, fucking yeah. big. They're huge. They're, yeah, they're huge. gigantic. They're huge. Uh, uh, and I really think it probably comes from people who see them and go, "Oh, it's sweet." And you got, and I, I got to think to them, "No, no, that's that's something that only gets eaten by orcas. That's what that is." Yeah, well, that was a brilliant random fact. That was great. Thank I you, love it. <laughs> All right. Well, Jim, thank you so much for hanging out with MJ and I today. It was an absolute absolutely pleasure. Nice. That was yeah, a pleasure. And, thank you very much. Uh, and if you could please let everyone know where they can find you online. Uh, you can find me at jimbutcheronline.com or at jim-butcher.com. 
JimButcher.com was already had already been bought out from under me ten minutes before I tried to buy it, and I refused to pay them an extra six hundred dollars for it. Uh, <laughs> so JimButcher yeah. online or Jim-Butcher.com. <laughs> awesome. And the Olympian Affair is out now when this episode airs. So go pick it up. Go see it. Is it's in, it's in Enjoy it. Enjoy it. I hope you like it. There's talking cats. There's duels. There's poison. Everything that makes life good. That's all you need, man. What more could you want? I mean, legitimately. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Oh, man. All right. Well, you can also follow SFF Addicts on Instagram, Twitter, threads, all that good stuff at SFF Addicts Pod, or you can follow me at Adrian M. Gibson. MJ, what about you? Yeah, you can find me on all the socials at MJ Kuhn Books, all one word, um, or MJKuhn.com. And if you sign up for my newsletter, you get my free novelette. So you can do that. (laughs) <laughs> the sham wizard of golden dawn go pick yes <laughs> yeah all right well that's it for this episode stay tuned next week for part two with jim for our mini master class on crafting an impactful sequel now keep reading keep imagining and we'll see you next time on sff addicts <laughs>